Hello. Do you like the painting? Please have a look. It's done by a 22-year-old lady from the Philippines. And uh, I thought that, uh, you know, the Philippines is uh, quite well known for its women presidents. But I thought it would be also proper that our artists are promoted. So we brought two tons of her paintings to Berlin. And this is one of them. I don't know how she did it. It's huge. And uh, anyway, artists have that space of, cre of creativity, which perhaps diplomats may not have. Anyway, let me take you to Asia. I'm sure, uh, I don't know if there was an Asian speaker before me. I think the Indonesian ambassador. And how many of you have been to our region? How many have been to the Philippines? How many have been to China? To India? Anyway, I'll take you on a little tour of the Philippines. But uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Mark, for remembering me to invite me here. Actually, this is a stopover uh, for several meetings. I was in the Global Summit for Women in Istanbul and then on to New York for a business meeting. And I decided to come back to Berlin to, to have this talk. Uh, it's the shortest, Berlin is the shortest way between New York and Manila. <laughs> it's 20 hours. Anyway, the Philippines, perhaps uh, to give you an idea or a little perspective, it's, it's a country of 98 million people. It has 7,107 islands. It has a literacy rate of 94%. Uh, English is the uh, medium of instruction because we have more than 80 languages. It is 90% Christian, so we are quite an aberration in Asia. Of the 90% Christians, 80% are Catholics and 5% are Muslims. In terms of our regional presence, we are a founding member of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. I'm sure you've heard about it from my colleague, the Indonesian ambassador. And we, I always like to refer to that group of 10 uh, Southeast Asian countries as the Association of Energetic and Ambitious Nations where good uh, 582 million people and a uh, great market. Uh, when I was ambassador here, I used to uh, have a difficult time putting in ASEAN into the mindset because uh, everyone was uh, afflicted with the China-India syndrome. You know, it was always a reference to China and India, forgetting that there's this group of wonderful 10 countries sitting there in the South Pacific. So let me take you to that part of the world. Uh, your topic, uh, Mark, is quite a mouthful. Hard and soft power in local and global politics, redefining concepts of power and influence in an age of interdependence, digital revolution, and social media. I asked myself, how am I going to unravel this? I decided, uh, after being overwhelmed by the coverage, to just focus on one trailblazing experience of the Philippines by localizing my uh, message uh, this afternoon on the use of the term soft power as it applies to a local event in the Philippines. Um, I looked at your program, and uh, certainly you had uh, quite a uh, dish full of lectures and discussions. So I decided to be very, very uh, limited in my focus, and uh, perhaps and hopefully that you would remember something of the Philippines when we leave Berlin. Uh, for this paper, I have used uh, Joseph Nye's term on soft power in the context of the ability of a political body to influence the behavior of other political bodies through cultural and ideological merits. I thought that was a wonderful definition. And uh, I also uh, 
would like to, in this context, highlight the Philippine experiment in terms of its contribution to the global debate on the use of soft power in local or national life and its impact on regional and eventually global politics. I believe that today's Arab Spring may be better understood by knowing how earlier people power movements succeeded in attaining its objective in, in, in attaining its uh, objectives in, chain, in causing regime change. On the local scene, let me highlight, therefore, a major event in our political life, which to my mind has found its permanent place, not only in the annals of our national history, but also in its overarching uh, impact on the history of nations. And I refer to People Power Philippines in February 1986. At lunch today, I had a wonderful new definition of people power from one of our colleagues, uh, Luke van der Brende, and he said, uh, people power is hard power turned to soft power. I thought that was a uh, uh, very interesting way to look at it. Significantly, people power in the Philippines made possible the nonviolent transition between an authoritarian regime and the restoration of democracy in a country with traditions of democratic institutions, however interrupted by a regime controlled by martial law. I think this is our unique contribution on the ongoing debate, and especially because people power in the Philippines by, was fueled mainly by civil society. Uh, for, for this reason, when I chaired the Security Council in, in New York, I was asked to make my own agenda. And so I offered an agenda which was close to my heart, civil society, the role of civil society in post-conflict peace building. And the guys in the Security Council said, ah, oh, that belongs to the third committee. You, you go to the ECOSOC, Economic and Social Council. It doesn't belong to the Security Council. So I got scared. And I went to Mr. Kofi Annan. I said, Mr. Kofi Annan, help me. But I want this agenda because I believe that in our experience, civil society played a major uh, role. And so should it play in other countries where you, after the military leaves, who is left to rebuild the country? Civil society. So I remember Mr. Kofi Annan saying, you are the chair, you decide. So I went back there and I said, I'm the chair and I decide, and the agenda is as follows. The role of civil society in post-conflict peace building. And fortunately, I tell you, if you're determined, on the same day, the Cardoso report, the famous Cardoso report of the UN on the role of civil society in nation building came out. Huge. Uh, television and uh, newspaper coverage. So my topic came just in time. So I shared in some of his glory, and he shared some of mine too in the Security Council. Well, people power Philippines defined. People power, as some scholars define it today, is a, quote, extra constitutional means of political succession. In the Philippine experience, it meant the removal from office of an elected head of state and government personified by the president through nonviolent civil resistance. Such resistance took place in the capital city of Manila on a main street known as EDSA. You know, in the Philippines, we like acronyms, something we inherited from our uh, past colonial masters. And uh, EDSA is named after one of our heroes, actually. The immediate spread to other centers of population were affected by a dedicated religious radio station called Radio Veritas. Now it can be told it was funded by the Germans, but in those times we were denying. As well as some clandestine, then clandestine opposition, uh, which led some radio stations to pick up what the civil society was saying. Some electronic media, of course, came into the picture, and television uh, followed by print media. Instantly, 
uh, I think you're all too young to remember 1986. The world's attention was drawn by real-time coverage by such television giants as CNN, which brought live people power images to living rooms around the world. Remember, this was 1986, perhaps before some of you were born. Or, Anyway, I was then chargé d'affaires in our embassy in Bonn because our ambassador resigned uh, in protest of the uh, current uh, president at that time. And I remember CNN coming, CNN Frankfurt coming to me and saying, please give a, a visa. We would like to send the fifth team to cover the people power revolution in case it gets messy. So television stations want to go when it's messy. But I had said, I hope you don't make it because there were already four CNN teams that were taking the uh, full coverage of the people power. Anyway, after a few hours, uh, he gets a call from the American embassy in Manila, and they said, you don't need to come. President Marcos agreed to take the helicopter and fly on to Hawaii. Of course, I called my foreign minister, and he said, that's not true. The president will never leave. Oh, gosh, I said, how do you convince that this was a very important message, and this was a verifiable message. But then the drama was, indeed, President Marcos and his family, and his, what they call his business cronies, left for Hawaii. This action, led by civil society, religious orders, the opposition, and by a sector of the military, especially the national police, led to the incapacitation of the ruling power to govern. I have to admit it was orchestrated by a very popular personality, the Catholic Archbishop with a wonderful name, Cardinal Sin. So he used to welcome us in the Archbishop and he says, welcome to the house of Sin. <laughs> he was the highest ranking uh, Archbishop in, in, in the Philippines. It was followed by the resignation of cabinet members, withdrawal of support by members of the diplomatic service. I myself, I had my own way to do it. Uh, as a career diplomat, you serve whoever is president. But at that moment, you have to decide what you want to do. And I drafted a letter to the president saying, Mr. President, please heed the call of the people and avoid bloodshed by all means. And I sent it out to my colleagues, and we all signed up, and that was our specific role in this whole episode. What led to People Power Philippines? It started as a civil protest against the attempt by then President Marcos to, quote, steal the results of the snap elections in order to validate his presumed mandate to govern the country. I don't know if the uh, Indonesian ambassador told you, but this was followed in 1998 by people power in Indonesia when President Suharto was asked to come down as well. The snap elections, this was uh, elections which was not in the regular schedule of elections, was preceded by allegations of widespread graft and corruption in government and its cronies resulting in the widening of the gap between the very wealthy and the very poor during the term, second term of President Marcos. The drop of public confidence in the leadership was made more dramatic by the change from a highly prosperous economy during the first term of the president in 1965, where the Philippines enjoyed an economy in Asia second only to Japan. The almost untenable situation preceding the snap elections led to the formation of movements, both radical and less radical, among others, uh, including some parts of the, some members of the military, as well as the members of the political opposition in the media. This situation was compounded by the rise of a separatist movement in the southern island of Mindanao, it's the southernmost part of the Philippines, which is uh, predominantly Muslim, 
and civil discontent at various levels of society. Because President Marcos was restricted by law to run for a third term, he declared martial law in between, justifying his act by highlighting the rising breakdown in law and order. He created emergency powers through presidential decrees, giving him full control of the military and the authority to curtail civil liberties. Congress was dissolved and critical media was stopped. Political opponents were arrested, including his staunchest critic, Senator Aquino, who was then being groomed to lead the opposition to challenge Marcos in the next round of elections. With most opposition leaders either arrested or in exile, Marcos further consolidated his powers by replacing Congress with a new, what they call a stampad parliament, and a new constitution. This enabled him to legitimize his rule for another 14 years beyond his two terms as elected president. With such extensive powers, opposition mounted until, and this is what broke the camel's back, the assassination of exiled political leader, Senator Aquino, on his return to the Philippines from self-exile in the United States. This event, coupled by a sagging economy, caused civil disobedience and non-cooperation among the Filipino people. The rapid deterioration of the economy and pressure from the United States led to the snap elections where the widow, Cory Aquino, of the slain senator, stood up to challenge the president. So you can see the role of women in the Philippines. The election, however, was marred by widespread reports of tampering of election results that even computer technicians who were working on election results walked out to protest the deliberate manipulation to ensure a Marcos re-election. Appalled by bold election irregularities and other disturbing circumstances and threatened arrest, some sectors of the military withdrew support and joined civil society in their clamor for change through people-powered demonstrations. The documentation of the dramatic events in February 1986 in real time by electronic media is said to have inspired popular protest movements in our neighbor South Korea and Indonesia and eventually in Poland in Europe. I recall very vividly President, meeting President Havel in Australia where I was ambassador and I gave him a dinner to say goodbye for him when he was on his way to the Philippines. I said, why are you going to the Philippines? He said, I would like to thank personally a people who inspired me with my own velvet revolution. So that was a personal experience which uh, I really treasure. The symbols of People Power Philippines consists of yellow ribbons. The theme song was tie a yellow ribbon. It, looked, it sounded very uh, uh, harmless, but it had a lot of political meaning. Yellow flowers, don't mistake me, the yellow suit is coincident. <laughs> it's not a political statement. There were also religious symbols, including the rosary and images of the Virgin Mary. They were adopted by subsequent popular movements aimed at dictatorships in some parts of the world, depending on religious and cultural, cultural context. However, it must be pointed out that the subsequent use of people power, which also removed another president from office in January 2001, and again its attempted use in 2005 against President Arroyo, has raised questions about the wisdom of resorting to people power as a vehicle for political succession in societies which are still undergoing early stages of transition to democracy. What are the prospects of people power in the Philippines today? While democracy allowed people a nonviolent way of changing a government with people willing to take risks, to take up and vote, to stand up and vote. This is something important. The vote still mattered. However, when the actual task of governing came about and the path of democracy was seen as rock strewn and twisting, 
Political observers noted that political change and democracy were then used by all the elite to get back to office. Democracy seemed not to dissolve all networks, but notably, whatever it was, the change was a transition to a more liberal, competitive, and transparent economy. Last week, I was in New York, and I uh, was quite, my attention was drawn to a book that was uh, just released uh, entitled The Unfinished Global Revolution by Sir, Sir Mark Mullock Brown, who used to be the head of UNDP. And the reason I was attracted to his book was because he was a political consultant to President Corazon Aquino. And he writes in the book, Despite the exuberance of the huge peaceful, peaceful expression of people power, real power did not lie with the people. Marcus lost because he was deserted by the business sector and then by the military. Yet the sheer tenacity of the old power centers was remarkable. What surprised me more, this is Mal Brown say, speaking, is old power's ability to co-opt the democratic process, or at least survive it, was its ability to endure in the face of democratic, demographic change. In commenting further on on other movements around the world, Sir Brown noted the special role of media, especially radio and television, in influencing major political changes to take place, such as the drama that took place 20 years ago right here in Berlin. In several political commentaries celebrating the 25th anniversary of people power in the Philippines this year, last February, a Filipino political scientist wrote on the subject, Modern Revolutions and the Mass Media. Tracing the history of revolutions, particularly citing the publication of the Communist Manifesto 163 years ago, he underscored the radical change in the conditions for revolutionary transformation of societies. While the industrial class was seen as the leading force of socialist revolution, the modern workplace has itself been transformed. The worker of today is likely someone trapped at his computerized workstations. Indeed, digital technology has revolutionized communications and has reconfigured the conditions of possibility of political revolutions. This is evident in recent political convulsions that are sweeping the Arab world today. We have been witnessing from the comfort of our TV rooms or planes, I've been on a plane for so many hours, the power of little electronic gadgets in the hands of the techno-savvy generation who can disseminate messages literally in the blink of an eye, take photos and videos, upload them on Facebook, or even transmit them to more mobile phones and computers around the world in real time. This can make today's revolutionary activists a kind of a one-man news bureau with a global outreach throughout the internet. As we are aware, the internet is a medium that is playing a powerful role in the political scene, both nationally and globally. Indeed, technology has altered the horizon of revolutionary struggle by conferring global sympathy upon spontaneous, unarmed, and nonviolent popular uprisings while summoning instant condemnation for the naked use of force by rulers. The author notes that apart from informing and enriching the perspective, of global, the perspective of global opinion, he cites a kind of a confirmatory function of mass media, namely that as soon as a mass action or event enters the media field of vision, media confirms the fact and gives it authority which goes beyond a witnessing function. 
Indeed, the four-day real-time media coverage of people power in the Philippines in 1986 gave the protesters the sense that the world was watching and that they were not alone in their quest for change. Courage was sustained and confidence for success was strengthened. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you want to stay there for one moment, Ambassador, oh, out there, we'd be happy to see if there are a couple of questions or comments uh, from the audience. I thought that was done. Yeah, since, since you're here. Uh, okay, I see one right here. Okay, John. Uh, I have a question. I live in uh, Bangkok, <clears throat> and I'm just curious where the, in your opinion, the red shirts uh, movement that uh, sort of exploded literally and figuratively last year in Thailand, where that fits into your people power spectrum, how you see that movement as people power or people puppets or something else? Uh, in Thailand, there were two colors. There was red and there was yellow. In the Philippines, there was only one color. It was yellow. I think that makes a big difference, which means that the, 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 the civil society, everyone was was one in their thinking and their voice. There was no separation between we are in the opposition, uh, you are pro-government. Uh, perhaps it's also in our culture in the Philippines. You know, we, we are easy to accommodate and uh, we have no strong political party history. We go where we think uh, we feel strongly for. So that, to me, is the major difference. Uh, there is a big... Uh, the, the big uh, divide between the yellows and the green and the reddies, not in the Philippine experience. Okay, one more in the back. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, your wonderful uh, lecture. Um, my name is Jonathan from Uganda. I have a question. You mentioned something about. Um, the rise in questions uh, about the viability of using uh, the people power in democracies that are still young and growing. Um, there is a situation in Uganda currently where um, the president who has been on for quite a number of years now is uh, trying to, I could say, put down an uprising of um, people who are marching in the streets and I could say under the guise of the rising prices of so many things, but it's because most of these um, uprisings are by pe the opposition parties, the opposition party leaders, and it has become, it has been a bit messy, really messy. I don't know if you've seen it on t Maybe it's not even focused because of being Uganda. So. How would you advise, or could you clarify a bit, because you just mentioned it seemingly in passing. Thank you. Yeah, you know, we, the, the first, we call it People Power One, was overwhelming. Uh, after a long period of uh, one-man rule, everybody was united to, to do something. The second People Power was a uh, question because it was mainly held in the capital, although it swept, the capital has 15 million people. So, uh, and they were within reach of uh, media, etc. But I, I can tell you that the second people power in the Philippines was not that popular because people in outside of the, the, the center of Manila were not too keen to, to really join it. And yet, because, again, here you have the power of media. It, it was concentrated on Manila, so it looked like everybody was on board. Now, uh, the third trial could not prosper anymore because people said, look, we have devised a, we have finished with martial law. We have finished, we are finished with a one-man rule. There are now accepted ways uh, generally accepted ways to change uh, authority, and that was the regularity of elections. 
unless you have that, you don't give the people a, uh, a possibility to look forward to something that would change it. And this was the, the uh, failure of Marcos. He wanted to extend forever his, his uh, regime. And people just wanted to stop it after 14 years after martial law. In the uh, second uh, people power, which succeeded, by the way, uh, was followed immediately by a very uh, strong uh, legal decision. We are a very legalistic society in the Philippines. And so a, a strong legal society, a legal decision, the Supreme Court, uh, approved that this indeed was a legal action of the people. But on the third, there was not enough reason to say this is an acceptable uh, people power uh, movement, and therefore there was no real support. The second people power came about because still, after the first people power, we felt that the uh, constitutional basis for change was not that strengthened, and so it allowed for the second to take place. But uh, seeing that, they looked for a, a legal way to, in order to put order, to say that the third people power could not be recognized because it was no longer, it did not have the true voice of the people. Of course, that is very relative what, when you say the true voice of the people. But uh, in sheer numbers, uh, the first was, of course, overwhelming. The second was also, but the third was not. So that was one of the basis for uh, the decision not to accept the result of the attempted third people power. So unless you have a strong legal system that would say, OK, this is acceptable, and I think this is part of what a democracy is, a the rule of law that you can really rely on. Uh, in terms of the Marcos regime, you see, he declared martial law. Therefore, everything was suspended. Your Excellency, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for once again inspiring and I think really enlightening not only the, the staff and the colleagues of the Institute, uh, but also all of the participants here. Thank you very, very much for having come and also for your lecture. Thank you.